Happy to be in California. I think it's my first time in California presenting this book, so it's it's a big deal for me. And so I want to. So Daniel told me to speak for 40, 45 minutes. Uh, so what I'm going to use these 40, 45 minutes uh, to speak about is my new book. Well, relatively new. It was published about two years ago. Uh, it's called Peaceland. So let me start by telling you a few words about what got me what got me started, uh, and what got me motivated, and five years later, eventually resulted in this new book, Peaceland. I have spent the past 17 years studying international peace building initiatives, mostly in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I'm going to show you a map later to show you where the, the Congo is uh, in the map of the world. So mostly in Congo, but also in many other African and non-African countries. And during this fieldwork, I constantly witnessed a puzzling pattern, which is that international interveners keep using, reproducing, and perpetuating ways of working that they themselves widely view as inefficient, ineffective, or even counterproductive. And by interveners, oh, I'm used to usually walking around when I, t when I speak, but um, OK, I'm going to stay here. So by interveners, I mean expatriates who work in peace building. So that includes donors, diplomats, uh, United Nations peacekeepers, other United Nations staff members, and the foreign staff of international and non-governmental organizations. And by peace building, when I say these people work in peace building, I mean that they work to promote any and all actions that help promote peace during and after a conflict. So you may be more familiar with the concepts of peacemaking or peacekeeping. My, when I say peace building, that includes all of that. That includes peacemaking, peacekeeping, long-term peace building. So let me give you a couple of the examples of these kind of puzzling patterns that recur whenever you're in a conflict zone. Um, it is now conventional wisdom that local ownership is absolutely essential for successful peace building. But local people, local stakeholders, are rarely included in the design of international programs. Another example is that scholars and practitioners regularly emphasize that it's very ineffective to use universal peace building templates, and that it's very important to adapt the activities to the context. And yet, interveners often use models that have worked in other conflict zones, but that are not appropriate for the specific local conditions. Local people and interveners themselves deplore the expatriate's tendency to live in a kind of bubble uh, when they interact mostly with other expatriates and where they lack contact with host populations. And yet, this phenomenon still recurs in virtually all areas of intervention. Why? And to me, the persistence of these ineffective modes of operation is all the more puzzling because peace builders, interveners, are not indifferent or callous. Most of them care a lot about the effectiveness of their actions. They're not stupid. Most of them are intelligent, they're well-read, they're well-educated people. Some of them even have a master's or a PhD from UCI or from Columbia University. No, not funny, okay. Um, <laughs> and the thing is that they're not even oblivious to the consequences of their standard practices. Some of them are actually very uncomfortable with the way international peace building operates on the ground. So my book is an attempt at understanding why interveners continue to perpetuate and to use these ways of working that we know, that they know, that we all know are inefficient, ineffective, even counterproductive. What I also found striking when I was in the field is that a number of individuals and organizations ignore or even actively challenge the international peace builders' dominant practices. And they suggest alternative modes of operation. And the existence of these exceptional cases raises two questions for me. First, what can we learn from them in terms of increasing the effectiveness of international peace building? And second, why haven't they managed yet to convince their colleagues to adopt the alternative modes of operation that have proved to be more effective. So 
Identifying the factors that impact the effectiveness or the ineffectiveness of international peace building is of critical importance to scholars, uh, to practitioners, obviously to people living in conflict zones. Because it's true that international efforts can succeed only when warring parties are ready to stop using violence and when local, national and regional peace building capacities are strong enough to make peace sustainable. But despite their limitations, external contributions can make the difference between war and peace. There have been a number of studies at the macro level and at the micro level that have shown that international support significantly increases the chances of successful peace building. And so when you look at the usual explanations for the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of international peace building, you see that they usually focus on three main themes. They focus first on material constraints. For instance, whether or not peace builders have enough funding to implement all of the projects that are necessary to re-establish peace. They also focus on vested interests. That is, peace builders prioritize either the pursuit of peace, which promote peace building effectiveness, or they prioritize the pursuit of their own personal, organizational, uh, national, or religious interests. And as a result, their project effectively promote these vested interests, but they have little effect on the actual construction of peace. And the last kind of explanation focuses on the imposition of liberal templates and values. Many scholars argue that Western and liberal values orient interventions towards strategies that are unproductive, that are ill-adapted to local conditions, and that this leads to peace building failure. While, while interventions that are uh, adapted to the context are culturally sensitive, these interventions are much more effective. So what I found in my research and the central message of the book is that the everyday dimensions of international peace building initiatives on the ground also strongly impact the effectiveness of intervention efforts. And by everyday dimensions, I really mean mundane elements. I mean the expatriates, the foreigners' social habits, uh, their standard security procedures, their habitual approaches to collecting information on violence. I also look a lot at the influence of informal relationships and personal practices on formal professional initiatives. And in my book, uh, I show that everyday practices shape the overall intervention from the bottom up. They enable, they constitute, they help reproduce the macro-level policies, strategies, institutions, and discourses that other political scientists usually study. They also explain the existence and the perpetuation of ways of working that interveners themselves widely view as inefficient, ineffective, even counterproductive. And I want to clarify from the start that my approach and existing explanations are not mutually exclusive, but rather they're complementary. And another important point is that my argument is not that we should eliminate support for international peace building altogether. There is, in fact, a wide consensus among scholars and host populations that external support and external expertise are often, not always, but often necessary for successful peace building. Foreign interveners have a number of distinct advantages when they are on the ground in a conflict zone. And I've listed the most important of these advantages on the slide. So what we need is not to forfeit these contributions, but rather to think about how we can increase the effectiveness of international efforts. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to tell you a few words about my theory and research methods and about the main contributions of my analysis. And then I will explain how interveners, how peace builders construct knowledge of their areas of deployment. And I will trace the impact that this process of knowledge construction has on peace building effectiveness. And then I will look at the everyday elements that make possible 
the counterproductive uh, practices and narratives and the phenomenon of knowledge construction that I just told you about. And again, I will look at the impact that these everyday elements have on peace building effectiveness. And then I'll conclude by summarizing the uh, policy and theoretical implications of my analysis. So let me tell you a few words. I, I don't know if many of you are familiar with peace building as, as a field of research. Um, but there are, I think, two major problems with the existing research policy and academic research on peace building. The first big problem is that most analysts focus on capital cities, headquarters, and on the dynamics of intervention and of peace building at the national and international levels. But when you're familiar with peace building as it actually works, you see that field-based peace builders enjoy substantial leeway in implementing their on-the-ground operations. Because instructions from capital cities and headquarters must always be interpreted, and because there is often a wide divide between field offices and capital cities and headquarters. So it's very important to study the specific dynamics of on-the-ground peace building. The second major gap is that most of the research focus on macro-level policies, strategies, institutions, and discourses. And this focus on the macro-level creates two significant research gaps that uh, we can fill by looking at the everyday practice of peace building on the ground. The first research gap is that we know a lot about these macro-level policies, strategies, institutions, discourses, but as of now, we know much less about the nuts and bolts of peace building, the banal, the everyday activities that actually make up the bulk of the peace building work. The other major gap is that while we have many fascinating ethnographic analyses of how the cultures and practices of host populations can promote or impair effective peace building, ethnographers have rarely looked at this doing, the peace building. And so as a result, we know very little about how the daily lives of the interveners, uh, their social circles, and the way they approach their work on an everyday basis actually influence macro-level actions and strategies. And there are a couple of researchers who have started looking at this topic in recent years, but they focus on uh, humanitarian aid, democratization, uh, space and security, or local ownership. So with my book, I want to contribute to this emerging body of literature by drawing up a portrait of the interveners with their practice, uh, customs, behaviors, and everyday lives. And this new approach produces findings that are different from those of existing research. Existing research on international peace building usually emphasizes differences among interveners. So a number of political scientists and anthropologists have shown that different cultures orient the interventions of different countries, organizations, or professional groups in dissimilar ways. This precludes the coordination that could achieve coherent strategies, and therefore it decreases the effectiveness of international efforts. So that's true, but at the same time, my research highlights commonalities among interveners. And in contrast to the body of research on the liberal peace, you may have read something about the liberal peace before, uh, what they say is that commonalities are based in shared values, shared representations, a shared liberal agenda, shared Western, Western values. And what I show is that no, commonalities are actually based on the everyday practice of peace building on the ground. And this new finding suggests a fresh answer uh, a fresh answer to the question of what affects the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of international peace building. I show that it is just as important to study the everyday practice, the daily practice of peace building on the ground, as it is to study the content or the ideological dimensions of the peace building programs. And so 
To document the influence of the everyday on international peace building initiatives, my research strategy has been to spend more than a year in, I promise you to show you a map, yes, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So you see Congo, it's here on the map of Africa. And uh, you may have heard of Congo before because it's the stage of the deadliest conflict since World War II. And what I did when I've, I've spent oh, several years already, already doing research in Congo, and so when I worked for this project, I decided to, uh, to be based in North Kivu. You see the province of North Kivu on the map. And I chose North Kivu because it was the most violent province of the Congo at that time. And because it was such a violent province, it hosted a very wide variety of peace builders, of interveners. People who came from all kinds of professional, national, uh, religious, uh, and organizational backgrounds. But while this in-depth ethnographic analysis gave me access to the culture of the interveners, I also needed to distinguish between those collective understandings that were limited to the community of peace builders based in Congo, and those that were shared by all peace builders, independently of where they were deployed. So I conducted research visits to other theaters of intervention in order to assess the generalizability of my findings from the Congo case study. And so I conducted research visits to South Sudan, Burundi, Cyprus, Israel and the Palestinian territories and Timor-Leste. And if you're interested, I'm happy to explain during the discussion why I chose these cases as shadow cases for my research. And I also build on my own experience as an intervener um, when I was working in Afghanistan, Congo, Kosovo and Nicaragua. And obviously, I also build on practitioners' reports and academic writings on many other international interventions. And in my main field sites, I collected four kinds of data to develop my analysis. Several years of field observations, uh, more than 294 in-depth interviews uh, with all kinds of peace builders, all kinds of foreign interveners, and with local populations, local staff, local authorities. <coughs> Document analysis, of course, analysis of multiple documents, uh, and what we call participant observations, uh, which included things like patrolling with United Nations peacekeepers or implementing reconciliation projects with United Nations staff members. So I really like this picture because that's me trying to pass as a blue helmet, as a peacekeeper. And that's me trying to be a good ethnographer, so trying to you know, blend in and be like everybody else. So you see the other guys in the background. The thing is that you can also see that I'm having a really, really difficult time blending in because first I'm a woman uh, and there were only men in the compound and on the patrol. And the second thing is that some, I, I had to wear this bulletproof jacket, and I hate wearing bulletproof jackets, so I never do. Um, and so they, they forced me to do it, so I put it upside down. And so I went patrolling, and I was patrolling for two hours with the peacekeepers, and I was like, yeah, I'm really looking like a peacekeeper. I have the blue helmet, I have the bulletproof jacket for once, uh, and I'm doing everything like they're doing. Uh, and nobody told me that I was wearing my bulletproof jacket upside down. It's only when we went back to the base, and I was like, you know, it, it doesn't protect anything. Uh, I really wonder why I've been worried, and it's super heavy. Uh, and people are like, yeah, yeah, you know, like you look really, really stupid when you were patrolling with that. <laughs> Anyways, um, let's focus on what's really interesting, which is the findings. So the first part of my book uh, focuses on the struggle over which and whose knowledge matters in Peaceland. In the current international system, the most valued expertise is that of interveners trained in peace building, humanitarian and development techniques, and with extensive experience in a variety of conflict zones. And in contrast, and although there are exceptions, the knowledge of country specialists is usually much less valued, and the knowledge of local people is usually trivialized. International and non-governmental organizations, just like diplomatic and donor missions, usually do not rely on anthropologists or historians who could help interveners gain an in-depth understanding of their work environment. Instead, 
they hire operational experts who have done the same technical jobs before. So they hire people who are trained in gender, uh, gender studies, or human resources, or financial operations, or organization of elections, you know, these kind of thematic things, rather than an understanding of the local con context. In terms of promotion and status, intervention structures usually value the number of missions in different countries, rather than the amount of time that someone spends in a particular mission. And in fact, the interveners who stay too long in a specific place, they are considered to have gone native, and they are thus discredited. And the consequence is that of all the expatriate peace builders that I met, only a few had pre-existing knowledge of their countries of deployment. All of the others had been hired for their substantive and technical capacities. Valuing thematic knowledge of our country-specific expertise results from various social dynamics, including the process of professionalization of international peace building, which has increased the effectiveness of intervention programs on the ground. But valuing thematic expertise of our local knowledge also results in standard ways of working in the field that decrease the effectiveness of international efforts. For instance, it legitimates the deployment of people who do not speak any of the local languages. Even though on the ground, everyone identifies the intervener's lack of linguistic ability as one of the main obstacles to effective peace building. It also leads to high rotation among interveners, which has a lot of negative consequences, such as um, loss of institutional memory and a lack of understanding of local context. Even more importantly, valuing thematic expertise of our local knowledge also asserts the superiority of the international staff who are viewed as having the consequential knowledge of our local employees. In virtually all aid and peace building organizations, whether diplomatic, international, non-governmental, expatriates are in management position, positions and local people make up the staff. Very few local people make it into leadership positions in their countries of origin. If they want to move up the hierarchy, they have to go abroad and become expatriates. And let me tell you a story that illustrates how the very fact of being local changes the way interveners relate to a person and his ideals. One of my interviewees, Michel, was a Congolese businessman. He's still a Congolese businessman. And Michel is from a mixed background. He has Belgian, Portuguese, and Congolese ancestors. And Michel was very frustrated at the way interveners behaved toward him and toward other Congolese elites during meetings. He thought that interveners were talking down to local counterparts and that they didn't take local ideas into account. So, during a meeting abroad, Michel conducted an experiment. Instead of introducing himself as Congolese, as he usually did, he pretended that he came from Puerto Rico. And the approach in the meeting was completely different. He had much more credibility and much more influence when he passed as an outsider. Another consequence of the fact that thematic expertise matters so much more than local knowledge is that intervention structures very rarely solicit local input in the design and plannings of their efforts. And this approach creates resentment among, among local people. And it is at the root of the phenomenon of local contestation, resistance, and adaptation that leads to the failure of so many projects and programs, and that other scholars like Oliver Richmond and Roger McGinty have documented so well. Of course, uh, local people often resist the international programs for their own benefits. Uh, for instance, to pursue their own personal, organizational, uh, professional, military, political, economic agendas, or just because they don't care about building peace. But not all local people have this kind of vested interests. 
And instead, uh, many of them truly care about building peace in their countries. And most of them would truly benefit from successful international peace efforts. So it is important to understand why the people who would in fact benefit from successful international efforts instead reject or distort them. And the main reason is the premium that interveners place on thematic expertise over local knowledge. In all of the countries in which I worked, local stakeholders complained that international peace builders were arrogant and that they provided aid in a humiliating manner. And my interviewees emphasized that the arrogance resided in thinking that the international ways of working are better than the local ones and in failing to pay attention to local ideals. And what's fascinating for those of us who work on peace building or for people who are interested in peace building is that I heard these kind of criticisms against all kinds of international interveners. So not only uh, people who, for example, insisted upon organizing elections, but also people who use foreign rather than local models of toilets to respond to water and sanitation emergencies. And my interviewees were very clear. They said that they do not resist or reject the international programs because of their content, uh, such as the supposed Western or liberal characters of the program, Instead, they reject the very act of imposition, regardless of whether or not they lack the strategies and the values that the programs convey. And the international organizations that fight against this trend are excellent illustrations of the advantages inherent to valuing local knowledge on par with thematic expertise. The few comparative eva evaluations of their efforts that exist show that these organizations are much more effective at promoting initiatives that are locally owned and locally supported and thus effective and sustainable. So the next chapter of the book studies the everyday manner in which in these circumstances international peace builders, those that are not exceptions, make sense of their environments. And I showed that the interveners face multiple obstacles when they try to collect and analyze data on their areas of deployment. And I trace the key consequences of the resulting lack of understanding of local contexts. And one of these key consequences is that the lack of understanding of local conditions usually entices international peace builders to rely on simple and often overly simplistic narratives to design their intervention strategies. Adopting dominant narratives offers a useful way out of the predicament that international peace builders face. Dominant narratives emphasize a few themes on which to focus. And interveners can then believe that they have a grasp of the most important features of the situation instead of feeling lost and deprived of the knowledge that they need to properly accomplish their work. But I developed an in-depth case study of the impact of dominant narratives on the conflict in Congo to eliminate the perverse consequences of this practice. In brief, in 2010 and 2011, but even still now, three narratives dominated the discourse on Congo and oriented the intervention strategies there. And if you've read any article on Congo in the past six months or in the past year, I'm sure that these narratives are gonna look very familiar to you. These narratives focused on the primary cause of violence, the illegal exploitation and trafficking of natural resources. They focused on a main consequence, sexual abuse of women and girls. And they focused on a central solution, reconstructing state authority. And thanks to the reliance on these dominant narratives, foreign and Congolese elites have managed to put the Congolese conflict on the agenda of influential decision makers in capital cities and headquarters. So that's absolutely brilliant, because before nobody cared about Congo. But the problem is that 
because of the reliance on these dominant narratives and on the solutions that they recommended, this has led to results that clashed with their intended purposes, including an increase in human rights violations on the ground. The focus on mineral resource exploitation has raised, no, has actually diverted attention from other causes of violence, and therefore it has decreased the overall effectiveness of the international peace efforts. The focus on sexual violence has raised the status of sexual abuse. It has transformed sexual abuse into an effective bargaining tool for combatants. And therefore, it has increased the use of sexual violence on the ground. And finally, the focus on state building has merely enabled the Congolese government and the Congolese army to become more effective perpetrators of human rights violations against Congolese people. And a number of Congolese people I interviewed for this project, along with the exceptional interveners that I mentioned before, all of these people have tried to reintroduce more complexity in the discourse on Congo, but thus far without success. The second part of the book studies the everyday routines that make possible the counterproductive practices and narratives that I just told you about. And I look again at the intended consequences of these routines, such as enabling interveners to function in conflict zones and enabling the organizations to help the host country build peace. But I also look at the unintended consequences. Notably the fact that these everyday routines construct and maintain firm boundaries, a firm separation between interveners and local people. And the fact that they perform, they make visible, they perpetuate, they reinforce an image of the intervener superiority over local populations, which these populations strongly resent. So, for the sake of time, let me focus on the three elements that are the most influential in constructing the boundaries, <clears throat> the separation between interveners and local people. The first element is that interveners all share a common official goal, to help the country of intervention and its people. And that's something very clear from the quote that I put on the slide. Here, we're all part of a club. We're all here to help Congo. And there are, of course, numerous internal differences in the process of reaching this common goal. There are also different degrees of motivation. But the shared objectives delineate the boundaries of the intervener's group. It defines who belongs to the community and who does not belong to the community. Foreign business people, for instance, are excluded for the simple reason that they do not share the same official goal. And so, the group of interveners include people coming from all kinds of national, professional, organizational, and religious backgrounds. And the presence of this community of interveners does not preclude the existence of the internal divisions and tensions that other scholars have documented. And if you're interested, I'm happy to explain during the discussion um, how the similarities coexist with the differences. But what's really interesting is that on the ground, two elements transform this loose group with a lot of internal divisions and tensions into an actual block with firm boundaries. The first element is that interveners share a common experience of life in conflict zones. And that goes well beyond the shared characteristics that we all know about such as the fact that peace builders uh, drive in big SUVs, that they have favorite bars, inside jokes, favorite topics of discussion. Beyond these superficial characteristics, I show that the feeling of belonging to a specific group is rooted primarily in the feeling of being a foreigner, living and working with no family life, constant fear, lack of basic facilities, and usually a job that is emotionally draining. And the quote that I put on the slide is typical of what I heard during my interviews and what I observed and experienced during my field work. <coughs> In war situations, you're in it together. 
in a country that you do not know, whereas people speak other languages that you do not understand. <laughs> we, interveners, we interact with local people all day long. But there are times when you want to, you want to eat your own food, listen to your own language, uh, speak your own language, listen to your own music. And at that point, my interviewee stopped and she looked me in the eyes and she said, you and I, we have millions of things in common. And you have to realize, I've never met this person before. And clearly, we have very different backgrounds in terms of national origins, <laughs> profession, organizational affiliations. And then she said, you and I, we have millions of things in common. You and Congolese, you have two or three things in common apart from work. This is why the expats go together. Because the, the expats in any country need to have a place where they can go and sit down just so that they are in their own world. It is necessary to keep you sane and anchored. And I heard this kind of deep emotional talks from all kinds of interveners no matter where they came from, what functions they had, and which organizations they worked for. The other element that helps reinforce the feeling of community despite all of the internal rivalries and tensions is the presence of others against whom interveners construct their group identities. And these others are notably the so-called locals, meaning the local authorities and populations who are the intended beneficiaries of the international intervention. And again, that's very clear from the quote on the slide. You and I, we have millions of things in common. You and Congolese, you have two or three things in common apart from work. And it's important to note that local people share responsibility for the separation that exists between them and interveners. In many settings, local people treat all expatriates as alike and separate from themselves <laughs> regardless of the intervener's national origins, profession, organizational affiliations. This reinforces the sense of community among interveners, and it further widens the split between the two groups. Local people also often make it extremely difficult for international interveners to integrate in their local communities. And that's something, again, that I want to illustrate with a quote on the slide. So this quote, I really like it because it's a quote from my, one of the exceptional interveners whom I interviewed. This guy had spent eight years in Congo. He had learned local languages. He had tried to develop strong friendship with Congolese people. He had married a Congolese woman and he had a child who was half Congolese. And yet, as you see, he felt that only his wife and his immediate relatives fully accepted him, while none of his other contacts did. And that's a complaint that I heard many times when I was talking with the interveners who tried to break the boundaries between them and local people. And my point here is that turning to other expatriates for support is a perfectly understandable response to the daily difficulties of intervening on the ground in conflict zones. It enables interveners to function in the difficult environments that they face. But these habits also has unintended consequences that decrease the effectiveness of international peace efforts. And in the book, I look at many other kinds of everyday routines that in everyday routines that interveners have to follow on the ground just to be able to live and work on an everyday basis. And I showed that these daily routines have the same kind of unintended counterproductive uh, consequences. Take the very fact of having to help be your primary objective and identifying local populations and authorities as beneficiaries. This actually embodies a claim to the moral high ground as was evident in the saying that constantly recurred in my interviews in Congo, Sudan, and Burundi, the hand that gives is always higher than the hand that receives. Take also the intervener's standard security routines, uh, such as driving with the doors locked and the windows closed. These security routines are perfectly understandable responses to danger, but at the same time, 
the further separate expatriates from local people. In the words of a Kenyan interviewee, they transform expatriates into other kinds of human beings. They also reinforce the data collections and analysis problems that interveners face because they curtail the expatriates' knowledge of the local realities that they want to change. And in the book, I look at many other kinds of everyday practices and habits, uh, such as striving to remain neutral and impartial, advertising actions, uh, quantifying the results of actions, and always writing reports. And I show again that all of these everyday routines are perfectly understandable responses to the difficulties of intervening on the ground in conflict zones. They enable interveners to function in the difficult and alien environment that they face, but they also have numerous unintended consequences that decrease the effectiveness of international efforts. And again, the individuals who challenge these personal and professional routines, who develop personal and social relationships with their local counterparts, who forego standard security routines, and who remain low profile and avoid, adver avoid advertising their actions. These people end up implementing projects that are much more effective. So overall, my project suggests a new approach to the study of international peace building, an approach focused on the everyday practice of peace building on the ground. This new approach produces findings that are different from those of existing research. Existing research on international peace building emphasizes the differences among interveners, while my research highlights commonalities among them. And in contrast to the body of research on the liberal peace, I show that these commonalities reside less in shared representations, such as a shared adherence to liberal values, they lie instead in the everyday practice of peace building on the ground. And these new findings suggest a fresh answer to the question of what affects the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of international peace building. Macro-level policies, strategies, institutions, discourses are not the only determinants of peace building effectiveness. The everyday practice of peace building on the ground also matters tremendously. And it is by looking at these everyday practices and habits that we can understand why interveners contribute to perpetuating modes of operation that they know, that we all know, are inefficient, ineffective, even counterproductive. Everyday practices, habits, narratives are perfectly understandable responses to the daily difficulties of intervening on the ground in conflict zones. They enable interveners to function in the difficult environments that they face, but these habits also have numerous counterproductive consequences that decrease the effectiveness of international peace efforts. And of course, I have developed a lot of policy recommendations based on this analysis. I have something like 30 pages of that in the book. Uh, but I think that the time for my presentation is almost up. So I'm just going to take one minute to emphasize the main ideas. International interveners could rebalance the role of local and thematic knowledge by following the model of these exceptional organizations that I mentioned during this talk. So concretely, that would mean changing recruitment and promotion practices for interveners, uh, relying more on local employees, uh, involving local partners and communities in novel ways, and creating tools and structures to gather local input from intended beneficiaries and from the local communities. We could also break the boundaries between the separation between interveners and local people by promoting socialization between interveners and their local counterparts, by creating structures for better relationships between interveners and local people, and by convincing interveners to forego standard security routines and the requirements to advertise their actions. And local people could further help break these boundaries by changing the way they routinely interact with foreign peace builders. 
So this is a very brief summary of a 350 page book uh, and of 10 years of research. So uh, my analysis is of course much more detailed than what I've been able to tell you in 45 minutes. So I'm more than happy to elaborate on any of my points and answer any questions you have. Thanks so much.